Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Amma ba'du We said that today we're covering the hadith Related to the prayer of Salatul Duha What is Salatul Duha? How many raka is Salatul Duha? When is this Salatul Duha prayed? Inshallah we're going to cover that and a little bit more And we're beginning with the hadith of Abu Huraira Radiallahu an in which he says, Awsani Khalidi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama bi thalathin Siyami thalathati ayyamin min kulli shahrin Wa rak'atayya al-duha Wa an utira qabla an anama Abu Huraira, he said that my friend, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised me to observe three things to fast three months, to fast three days in a month to pray two raka of Salatul Duha and to pray the witr before sleeping. We want to revisit the first part that we discussed earlier about having khalil and having friends that are non-Muslim. Because I feel that maybe there are certain people that, you know, that, that what I said still wasn't clear enough or, you know, maybe, you know, um, feel like I may be preaching a very strict brand of Islam. But let's just deal with the text of the Prophet The Prophet, he says, You are on the religion of your friend. You are on the religion of your close friend. So that would mean what? If your close friend is Hindu, then you would be upon his religion. If your close friend is Christian, then you would be upon his religion. These are not my words. It's not my religion. I can't make it up as I go along. I would love to be friends with, you know, Smurfs, but you know, this is not my religion. This is the religion of Allah, and Allah, he legislates to his prophet. And so when the prophet says, So be careful and look to who you take as your close friends. That does not mean that you cannot have non-Muslim friends. That's not what this is saying. Hey, 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 hey. Attention, attention. That does not mean you cannot have non-Muslim friends. That's not what it means. But you should be careful, be careful who you take as an intimate friend. But is that just, you know, one rule and it doesn't have any variances in it? No, nothing, in, nothing just has one rule. There's always a condition that would make it easier or that would give you other options. For example, if you have non-Muslim friends that are really good people, can you keep them close to you? Yes. yes, under a condition. Under the condition that you are the positive influence on them and not that they are the positive, that not that they are an influence on you. You can keep them. You can keep non-Muslim friends as long as you are the one that is influencing them and they are not the one that is influencing you. Because if they are the ones that, are, that is influencing you, then then you are on your friend's religion. But if you have a good friend, you know, you guys grew up together in the neighborhood over here, Ben Sahers from second grade, non-Muslims, you guys grew up and all that, played and fought and slept over each other's house. As long as you see that you're the one that's being a positive influence on that person, you could keep them close. For example, my friends, I had no Muslim friends growing up. And my young brother in front of me, my younger brother Hussein, could testify. How many Muslims lived on the block we were on? Zero. How many Muslims was in the school we went to? Zero. How many Muslims was anywhere? Zero. None. And the Muslims that were around, they didn't want to be our friends. The Pakistani kids in school, they wanted to be your friend, my friend? No. Hell no, they didn't want to be our friends. The Arab kids in school, did they want to be me or your friends? Hell no, they didn't want to be our friends. So I didn't have any Muslim friends. All my friends were non-Muslims. And they had no other choice. There was no one else. But my friends, my Khalil, those who were most intimate to me, there were two. One was Haitian and one was Puerto Rican. One was Haitian, one was Puerto Rican. I'm friends with the, to them, I'm friends with them to this day. From the time I was 11, I was calling them to Islam. We would play handball, we would ride our bikes, we would do a whole bunch of things. We would fight, we would throw firecrackers in the street, we would throw bottles, we would do a whole bunch of crazy things. But I would call them to Islam with the little bit of Islam that I knew. They would be receptive to it at times. Sometimes they would reject it at times, 
but I was consistent on it because I knew that they looked as me as like the leader of the group. And 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, by 17, both of them became Muslims. Both of them, my best friends, both of them, Jerry and Matthew, they're both Muslims now. So I can have non-Muslim friends as long as you are influencing them. They both accepted Islam. It took seven years. There were times when I felt like they just wouldn't accept the religion at all. And I said, man, you know, but I still kept them close to me. Why? Because I knew that I was the one that was leading this pack. I wasn't following anyone. They were my group of friends. And Alhamdulillah, Allah, he guided them. And they're Muslim now. On the other side of that coin, my wife, she's Russian. I met her here in, in Bensonhurst, 86th Street Bay Parkway, Petland Discounts. I used to work in there, catching fish, feed a fish in the tank, cleaning the bird cages, cleaning the rat cages, really bad days. And she came in and she fell in love with me. I can't blame her, fine, she fell in love with me. She brought three of her friends to the store to see me. Like, there's this guy, I like him, look at him. They all hated me. Do you know why they hated me? Because you weren't enough. Because of what? Because you weren't enough. Uh, well, nobody had any jobs at that time. I mean, they were in high Everybody was, because I'm Muslim. What's the second thing? Because I'm black. Because I'm black and because I'm Muslim. Those are the two things. There's only one more X that you can get. You know, like a bottle of poison has three X's. You could be Muslim, that's one X. You could be black, that's two X. And you could be proud. Oh my God, that's the third X. You, so they want you to be an apologetic black person. Like black, but just don't mention your blackness. Like don't be black. Like don't grow your hair. Like, you know, put something in it. Make it look curly. Just don't be natural. And they didn't like that. And she said, no, but I like him and this and that. And she came to the store every Thursday and every Thursday I would give her dawah. She would actually ask me the question, do you believe that women have to wear hijab? First question straight off the bat. Yes, I do. Do you believe that men should grow their beards? Yes, I do. Do you believe, do you believe, do you believe, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, she becomes Muslim. We get married happily ever after. Question, her three friends, her best friends that she grew up with in Bensonhurst and went to Brighton Beach with, her Russian friends, she's Russian. How many of them are still her friends today? None. Nil. Zero. None. None. Not because she pushed them away, but because they said, I don't want to be friends with somebody who's Muslim. So we are not saying to go back to this in the beginning. We are not saying it's not permissible to have non-Muslim friends. It's not what we're saying. We're saying that, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that you are on the religion of your friends, so you should just be very careful who you take as a friend. What would I advise my children? What would I advise my brother? What would I advise my close friends, you guys? I would say to you, no problem. You could take the non-Muslim as a friend. He could be your sadiq. You can have a lot of friends. What about if you have a non-Muslim that is very close to you? You can still keep that relationship as long as you are being a positive influence on them and not that they are the one that is influencing you. You wanna try this drug, you wanna try go to the club, you wanna try this drink. If it's that way, cut that friend off and leave it because that friend will lead you to destruction. But if you have a friend that you've known since you were a child and that person, they look up to you, you know, they, they, you know, they hang out with you, maybe they even fast with you in Ramadan or they try to fast, then keep those friends because maybe Allah will guide them through you. So do we have any questions or comments or anything that wants to be said about the issue of non-Muslims being our friends, being intimate friends? Any questions on this? Fadla. It's pretty hard to like, cause like Islam to them, it's like anyone not Muslim, it's like it's kind of like forbidden. So like, would that be like taking into account? Cause it's like, it's just unimaginable if like you become Muslim when you're not not Muslim, cause like everyone sees it as a, like, it's like so bad and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was like hard for like someone not Muslim in America to become Muslim. <laughs> So that's just a comment. It's not a question, right? Uh, that's just a comment? Yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, people becoming Muslim, non Muslims becoming Muslims, it's a challenge because there's a lot of bad stigma type attached to Muslims now. But Islam is still the fastest growing religion in America and it doesn't stop the people from accepting the religion. So, you know, even though it's difficult, it's something that we shouldn't give up on. 
because when people are faced with truth, they are going to be drawn to it and accept it. What do you think is better, a, like a bad Muslim or a good non-Muslim? Bad Muslim or good non-Muslim? I would say it depends, Malik Salam. I would say it depends. I mean, you know, in the it, as a religious context, in the religious context, the worst Muslim is better than the best non-Muslim as it relates to religion. Why? Because even though that Muslim, he's very bad and worse, he has not committed the worst sin. You ask the question, your phone's on? He has not committed the worst sin, which is to associate partners with Allah. So the worst Muslim is better than the best non-Muslim in the sense of religion, in a religious context. Because even the best non-Muslim, they don't believe in Allah. They don't believe in the Prophet. They don't believe in any of those things. But the bad Muslim, at least he has that. And even though he's bad, maybe, maybe, Allah will forgive him of all his sins and enter him into paradise on the day of judgment. But that is not something we count on. You know, we don't bet on that. We don't say, well, you know, the bad Muslim is better than the best non-Muslim, so, you know, inshallah, I'm gonna just bet and roll the dice on that. No, because if you're planning like that, then Allah is the best of planners. You'll just be thrown into the fire of hell. But as it relates into dunya matters, then definitely I wouldn't keep a bad Muslim friend company. I'd rather keep a non-Muslim company who has akhlaq and good behavior and good manners close to me. Because the non-Muslim, the, the Muslim who's a bad guy, he could steal, rob, lie, cheat to me and hurt me. So, you know, it depends on what scale we're looking at it as. Any other questions in the back about friendships, making friends, keeping friends, non-Muslim, Muslim? No? I agree with you. You're, you're right. You're right. As we mentioned, there's always exceptions to the rules and there's always those special people. Maybe the people that you're talking about who are very positive and influence, and influence you in a good way, maybe one day they'll become Muslims themselves. Is it possible? It's possible. So then we're not in disagreement. Everything, we're in agreement, inshallah. Any other questions or comments as it relates to the friendship area? of the friendship, uh, having friends, non-friends, all this. So in general, as we mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ, he's just giving us some advice and a warning that we should be very, very careful who we keep very close to us. That's it. It's just a warning. He didn't say you can or cannot have. I just gave you my opinion on the matter. But he said, just look to who you keep close to you. Why? Because you are upon the religion of your nearest friend. So Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said, that the Prophet advised him with three things and the first of those three advice was that he should fast three days every month. It's amazing because you don't find that we take advice anymore. Like we are not a generation that asks for advice or takes advice. And the advice sometimes that we give is very horrible too. Maybe we just don't have any practice in this, you know. You read these old texts and it's like, someone on their deathbed and advise me and you know they give this whole big beautiful advice like, when was the last time that ever happened to anyone in this room or anyone in the last hundred years you know we're so far from that but that's what this religion is isn't it or it should be the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said what ad-deenun nasihatun ad-deenun nasiha ad-deenun nasiha the entire religion is giving good advice it's giving good advice so we should become more comfortable with advising one another instead of this branch of Islam where it's like, hey, just mind your business. They can do whatever they want to do as long as it's not affecting you. If you had a brother or a sibling who was doing something the wrong way or the hard way, you know, wouldn't you advise them say, hey, you don't have to do it that way. That's hard. You could do it this way. Well, if you really believe that, you know, that we are brothers and sisters to each other and you have that friendship, 
don't be shy to advise, especially those people who you take as friends. One of the great scholars, his name was Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, great scholar, amazing story, started seeking knowledge when he was 40 years old and is like one of the big ulama to this, to, in, in, in Islamic history and he started very late in life. He said a statement and it's so true because I tried it a few times and lost a few friends using it. He said, if you want to know if you really have a true friend, advise him. If you find that after you advise them, you and them get closer, that was a real friendship. But if you find that after you advise them, you guys get apart, then know that that wasn't a true friend. I said, wow, this is really good advice. Let me put my friends to the test. You know, my two friends I told you about, Jerry and Matthew, I advise them all the time. Sometimes we yell and scream, but we still call and they want to hang out. I'm told them I have a class tonight. So, you know, we're still friends. But I have another friend too. And a quick incident. He calls me, right? And he goes, um, oh, um, the Ramadan and, you know, should we fast this day or fast the next day? Because, you know, who knows when it's going to end? In Saudi, they say they saw the moon. This place, they didn't see the moon. This is not this year. This is like four years ago. So I said, you know, no problem. You know, um, just, just fast the next day and, you know, and inshallah, it'll cover it. Whatever the issue was, don't quote me on it. But it was an issue on fasting. And I told him, don't worry about it. Just fast and, you know, it's going to cover it. It's going to fulfill it. He begins to give me this huge lecture. Oh, but you know, the intention is very important. And I made an intention today to fast this day as the 29th. So if I just fast an extra day and he got all technical with me. And I'm like, subhanAllah, like this guy knows I have a master's degree in Islamic studies. I mean, I haven't kept it from him. Certain people I kept it from, but him, he knows. Like, why is he trying to flex his muscles on me and like tell me about, do you, you, you know, know the intention and the this and the that and start coming with these rules. I just said, okay, inshallah, okay. The next morning after the Fajr prayer, I get a text message. He forwards me the fatwa of Amja, the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. And guess what they said? The same thing I said. So he calls me up, yo, akhi, yeah, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, Allah's religion is easy. You read Allah bikum al yusr, wa la you read bikum al usr. You could just, you know, fast the next day that, I said, yeah, akhi, didn't I tell you that yesterday? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I said, you know, I'm offended because I told you yesterday and you know that I have studied when I'm talking about the religion. It's not like I'm talking about sports. It's not like I'm talking about something else. When I'm giving you something in the religion that, you know, you knowing my history should, you know, be able to take that with a little bit of confidence. Ah, oh, but you know, Hassan, the way you give advice, you never say like, Qal Rasulullah and the ulama and this could be found in this book. I said, because we're friends. Why do I have to tell you like the chain and what books you can find it? We're friends. You should, I should just be able to tell you. I don't want to make you feel low. I don't want to start quoting and, you know, make myself look like I'm so, oh, well, you know, just a lot of other people, when they give fatwas and stuff, when they give their opinions, they give a whole bunch of evidence. I said, well, we're friends. I don't need to do that. After that phone conversation, I didn't hear from him for two years. I didn't hear from him for two years. And we just actually started connecting maybe like six months ago. So SubhanAllah, if you want to test your friendship, advise the people who are near you. After that advice, you think you see that you guys are getting closer, it's a good friendship. After that advice, you guys fall apart, alhamdulillah, because it wasn't a good friendship to begin with. Question? Advise Why what? Advise what? Advise your friends. I don't know with what you see something. I don't know. You know, I mean, what are your friends doing? We all need to be advised, right? Whether it's in religion, whether it's in life, whether it's in being more respectful to their parents or elders, whether it's, you know, um, the type of person they should marry, whether it's, you know, coming to the masjid more often for lectures and not just being home all the time, whether it's spending less time on Facebook and, you know, sending more text messages reminding each other to do good deeds, like, you can always find something to advise your friend in. There's no way your friends are done for 10 years and they've never done anything that you thought you could advise them to do better. In religious-wise or dunya-wise or worldly-wise, Advise your friends. Don't be shy to advise your friends. It only could help you. Any other questions on that? So, the Prophet, 
He advised him with fasting three days in a month. And as we mentioned, that on the day of judgment, there will be different gates and the angels at those gates will be calling you. So the person who used to pray a lot, the gate of prayer will call and say, Ya Hussein, enter into this gate. Give us honor by being one who enters through this gate. Don't go through the gate of charity, Zakat. Come through our gate. You know, we want to have you. MashaAllah, the whole life, you were always one who was very steadfast in your prayer. You always tried your best to make the prayer on time. You always tried to come to the masjid on your days off from work. Come and enter through our gate. While the gate of charity may be saying, No, 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 don't go through the gate, Fatima. Don't go through the gate of Salah. Come through the gate of charity because you were always very charitable. You always gave. Whenever the Meshach was having a fundraiser, you was the first one. You always tried to raise your hand. You may not have been able to give the thousand, but you were the first to raise your hand and give whatever you could give. Enter through this gate, honor us. And so the angels at the different gates will be, you know, competing with one another. Why? Because they want the most people who enter paradise to go through their gate, you know, as a form of, you know, good rivalry. And we have the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in which he was talking about these, the different gates of paradise. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, he asked and he said, being a high achiever as he was, Ya Rasulullah, is there anyone who will be called by every gate? You know, you and me, when we hear this, we think like, okay, well, charity, I don't give it. So, later for that fasting, I can only do it in Ramadan. Inshallah, I'll be called through the gate of uh, Salah. You know, inshallah, I'll be called through the gate of reciting the Quran. I used to recite the Quran a lot. We already know there are certain things we don't do. So we're like, maybe this gate. But Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, what is he looking for? Every gate. Is every gate. He's hungry. He's hungry. I want to be called by every gate. I want that. I don't want to just be called by one. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, and you are one of them. Yes, there will be some people who will be called by every gate of paradise. Ya Abu Bakr, come to the gate of charity. Ya Abu Bakr, come to the gate of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Abu Bakr, come to the gate of Salah. They'll all be, imagine, imagine. You have some people, their knees are knocking and they're nervous and they think they're going into destruction. They may be doomed, Allah may punish them. And then you have Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the few people who have reached that status in life who will be standing easy, smiling, looking at all of the angels, at all of the doors, inviting them into paradise. I mean, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those whom are called by all of the gates of paradise. You had a question? Um, no, oh yeah. um, doesn't matter which gate you go into, doesn't matter which one you go into uh, for you because your place in paradise has already been set you will know your place in paradise you will recognize your home in paradise better than you know your homes here but does it matter to the angels who are in charge of that gate yes because they want to be the one to say the majority of the people who entered paradise came through our gate the gate of charity you know that's how they brag i mean they have to have fun too in life. Why the bragging bragging is good as long as it's for the hasanat and the good. Yeah. Allah says race with one another to do the good deeds, right? It's in the Quran. So that's good. Inshallah. And so the three days. What are the three days that one should fast every single month? Should. It's not a fault. It's not an obligation. What are those three days? The sister she mentioned them. What were those three days you said? What were those three days that you should fast every single month? Should. 13, 14, 15 of the of October, November, December, or 13, 14, 15 of like Muharram, Rajab, Dhul Ka'da? Well, that I don't know. <laughs> no, you're overthinking the, the question. Is it 13, 14, 15 of the Islamic calendar or 13, 14, 15 of the Gregorian calendar? Islamic calendar. So it's the 13, 14, 15 of every month, not the time, the date that's on your phone. Today it says 27th. I don't know what it is in the Islamic calendar. I don't have it on the app on my phone. It's, uh, but it's the sixth. Okay, so it's the sixth. So in like the next nine days, no. Week. In a week, we're gonna be at the thirteenth day. Question. Why? Why thirteen, fourth, fifth, and not like twenty, twenty-first, twenty-second? That's a beautiful question. Nobody knows why, because the prophet I said them. He said thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. That's it. Maybe it's in the middle I mean, maybe it's because the temperature is cooler. Maybe it's because crickets make more noise in the dirty foot. Maybe it's because, uh, you know, the clouds look more beautiful. Who knows? I mean, we could, we, could, we could guess, but we don't have a real answer for that. No one knows why those three days. It just is. Um, I heard there's a scientific fact, like about the moon and the earth. 
What's the scientific fact? <laughs> okay, well, maybe it is a scientific fact. Um, you know, maybe, inshallah, who knows? Who knows why? The point is that it's the 13th, 14th, and 15th of every Islamic calendar month. And so. I have a question. Uh, um, how. How do you how do you find encouragement to want to do more than like salat duha, right? That's like there's fun, the things we have to do, the basics, right? You mentioned like fasting and all the is the basic. How do we gain more encouragement to do more than just basics? Because sometimes you're like salah, sunnah, even our like the class, right? Just right. feel like I you mentioned in the beginning, but for our those who may be doing that we're here. What, what do you do to keep wanting more? What if you're not wanting more? Maybe you're just like, yo, I just, shall I go to Jannah? That's it. Like, you know what I mean? Right. If we even know what, if we are, you know what I mean? Like, how do you find right. that encouragement to want to do more? Mm. So, how do you find the encouragement to want to exceed just the minimum? Uh, first and foremost, any individual who wants to get into paradise. If his desire is to get into paradise, it would necessitate that they don't just do the minimum, right? So if you're studying for the SATs, you know, it wouldn't be sufficient if you just studied like one day a week because you want to pass, you want to get a good grade, you want to get into a good school. And anyone who wants something in life, you find they're just, they're just studying every day. Is it necessary to study every single day to pass the SAT? I'm sure it's not. But just the desire, just the hunger that you want to get this certain grade, you want to get into this certain elite school would drive you and motivate you. So one, one way to motivate ourselves is by our desire to get into paradise. If you truly want to get into the paradise, then it would necessitate that you do more than just the minimum. Even in those moments when you are feeling lazy, you will tell yourself, no, I want to get into the paradise. I want to make sure. And I don't just want to get in. I want to go to Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. I want to be at the highest point. I want to be in the company of the companions. That's what I want. So if that's what you want, if that's your target, then that should motivate you to do more. Two, the second way that we can motivate ourselves is by remembering Allah's punishment is by fleeing from the fire. One way we motivate ourselves is by wanting the paradise and going towards Al-Jannah. And the other way we motivate ourselves is by looking behind us and saying, I don't want to fall into that fire. We have the famous hadith of the Bedouin. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, tell me what I have to do to, be, to enter into paradise. Just let me know the basics. You have to pray five times a day. You have to fast for Ramadan. You have to give charity. You have to make hajj in your lifetime and so on and so forth. The, the man, the Arabiyun, the Bedouin, he said, fine, I'm going to pray five times a day. I'm not going to do anything more than that. I'm going to fast Ramadan, and I won't even do a single day after that. I'm going to pay my zakat, not going to give any more. I don't care how many fundraisers they have. I'm not giving any more than just the minimum zakat. And I'm going to try to perform the hajj if I could do it. The pro and he left. The Prophet ﷺ said, if he is true to what he said, then he will be successful. But the reality is what? Don't no one raise their hand, is this is not a circle where we're outing ourselves. But is there anyone in this room that has not missed a prayer? The Prophet said, if he is true to his statement, that he will just do the five and not do nothing more, he will just maintain that five, then he will be successful. Technically, you will be successful. But when we apply it to our lives, how many of us have never missed a prayer ever in our life? Not a single person in here. Not a single person in here. How many of us are on top of our obligatory duties? Well, you guys haven't reached that real age. Well, no, you have reached the age where zakat is obligatory upon you, but all of you are broke, I assume. No one's buying my book, so all of you must be broke. Um, so, you know, um, how many of us are doing that? How many of us are, are keeping to that? Even when it comes to the Hajj, we may have certain wealth. Our relatives may have certain wealth. We may have uncles and aunts who fly back and forth to Jordan all the time, fly back and forth to Egypt all the time. And what are they waiting on? Why don't they go make the Hajj? Why don't they go perform the Hajj? 
They're flying every year, every year home going back, you see them every year. Uh, I go to the store, get my, my shake in the morning when I'm at work, and the Yemeni brother's in there, yo, I'm going back to Yemen, Adan, yeah, I'm gonna be there. Three months, three whole months, alhamdulillah, I wanna get out of here, uh, akhdar, it's green, it's beautiful. Every year you're flying to Adan for three, four months. Why don't you spend, just go make Hajj one time. You have three months off, go make Hajj one time. So, we, it is very difficult for us not picking on anyone who's Yemeni, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. So, it is very difficult for us to just do the minimum. It is very difficult. Technically, it's all you need, but in real life scenarios, it's very difficult. So we should try to motivate ourselves by either desiring the paradise, or we should motivate ourselves by our desire to flee from the fire. And you know, inshallah, Allah knows best after that. Any questions or comments? Okay, so the three days, as we mentioned, one of those three days, 13th, 14th, and 15th of every single month. And uh, one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uh, was once eating with a group of uh, tabi'een, the followers. And so when they were eating with him, uh, he was teaching a, a lesson after that, and he said to his students, I fast for the entire month. Every month, I fast the whole month every month. And so a few of the other students said to him, what are you talking about? You were just eating with us. How do you say that you fast every single month? Because we have another hadith of the Prophet in which he says, anyone who fasts just three days in the month will get the reward of fasting the entire month. This is how Allah is. This is how generous Allah is. Allah is Al-Kareem. He's very generous. Allah is Al-Jawad. It also means very, very generous. So Allah is generous to us. You just give him three days, he writes it down for you, you did the entire month. You pray five times a day, he writes it down for you that you did 50. In tuquridullah qardan hasana, yudha'ifu lakum wa yaghfir lakum. Whoever gives Allah a goodly loan, he doubles it for him. Allah never gives you what you actually gave him. Every time Allah gives you more and more and more and more than that. Can those three days be any day of the month or the 13th, 14th? 13th, 14th and 15th of every month. 13th, 14th, 15th of every month. And then what's Monday, like, what's, if, what's Monday, Thursday? Like, what's the reward for Monday and Thursday? Monday and Thursday is just another sunnah of fasting that we should do. This is just one of the behaviors or one of the uh, 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 qualities or traits that the Prophet ﷺ, he would do. Why? Because there were certain companions who wanted to do more. You know, right now we're thinking like, dang, does it have to be 34 to 15? Can't it be like the first, second, and third? You know, we're already trying to find a way out, you know, like Mondays and Thursdays, but the companions, the majority of them, one of the companions, Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As, one of the young companions, he wasn't even 17 when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. He narrated the most hadith on whose authority? We know the person who narrated the most hadith from, the, from all the companions was Abu Hurairah. But Abu Hurairah, he said, there's only one person who narrated more hadith than me, that's Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As. And so, he came to the Prophet, he said, I wanna fast every single day. The Prophet said, no, don't do that. Just fast the 13th, 14th, 15th of every month. You get the reward for the whole month. I want more. I want more. The Prophet said, okay, then Mondays and Thursdays. Why? Because these are the days that the angels, they come down, and they switch. The angels, they stay with you, writing all the good deeds that you do, and on Monday, they go back up and another one comes down to start writing some more. And on Thursdays, they go back up and another one comes down to start writing some more. And the Prophet, he said, I love to fast on Mondays and Thursdays because when those angels are changing shifts, I want them to know that when they go up and it sees what was, what, how did you leave my servant? I left him fasting. And then when the angel comes down and Allah asks, how did you meet my servant? I met him fasting. Every time, Mondays and Thursdays, Mondays and Thursdays, these angels, they change shift. Abdullah bin Amr bin al-Az, he says, I could do more than that. I'm not done. I could do more than that. The Prophet said, okay, fast every other day, because this is the fast of Dawood alayhi salam. Abdullah bin Amr bin al-Az, he said, what? I could do more than that. I don't think we would find anyone alive today that's so hungry to get the good deeds. You know, the majority of us are always trying to escape it. And the Prophet said, 
There is no more than that. There is no better than that. The best fast is the fast of Dawood. He would fast one day and break it the next. Fast one day and break it the next. Guess what happened when Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As became an old man in his 80s? He sat and he was sad and he would cry. And he said, I wish I took the advice of the Prophet wasallam because I find it very difficult to fast every other day. Like I'm old now, I'm 80 years old. Fasting every other day is very difficult. Does that, any questions pop in your mind why he would cry when he said, I wish I took that advice? Doing that right now, fasting every other day is difficult. And any, you guys, any, anything is bubbling in your mind with that? Why is he still doing it? Why is he still doing it? Just stop. Who has to fast every other day? Is that a part of the religion? No. No. But this is what separates the companions from us. This is why Allah, he said, Allah is pleased with them. And they are pleased with Allah. Allah didn't say he's pleased with you and me. This is why Allah says he's pleased with them. Because when they made an oath, they stuck to it. Till death. This is one of the, the traits of the Arab, the Arab, even during the time of Jahiliyyah, even though there were a lot of criminal behavior that they used to do, one of the virtuous things, and there were a few virtuous things, one of the virtuous things that they would do is when they gave you an oath, they met that oath to death. This was one of the things. Now, inshallah means you're never gonna get it. <laughs> Just a translation. You had another question in the middle of the hadith. Um, why, why does that be Monday and Thursday? Because between Monday and Thursday is four days. Why can't it be another four days? Because the angels come down on Monday and Thursdays to write your deeds. Why do they come down on exactly? Because Allah told them to come down on Monday and Thursdays. I go to work Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Why? Because my employer told me, Hassan, I'm only going to pay you if you show up Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Fridays and Saturdays, I'm off. If I show up to work tonight, they're not going to pay me. If I show up to work tomorrow, they're not going to pay me. Why? Because they make the stipulations. So Allah, He says, your job is to write this person's good deeds and you go down on a Monday and you come up on a Thursday because I'm the boss and you got to do it. And the angels, they just go, they don't say, but Tuesdays I'm watching the game, Wednesdays I have this. They just do what they say, unlike us who do what we want. Okay, um, you know the sign says back up on you? Okay, good. <laughs> um, they say on the 3rd before the 15th, the moon comes closer to the earth, and we, like our humans, we get more anxious and more angry. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that, and when we're fasting, we become more calm. Mm, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool, alright. <laughs> it doesn't make me want to do it anymore. It doesn't make me want to do it any less either, but that's cool. <laughs> you know, this is a beautiful thing that we can find scientific benefits to justify our acts of worship, right? So it's like someone asks you, why don't you eat pork? And the first thing you say is like, you know, scientific fact, like pigs, they are like very dirty and there's like bacteria in their stomach and even if you cook it right, you could still get sick. But that's not really the reason why you don't eat pork. Haram. We don't eat pork because it's haram. We don't eat pork because Allah has prohibited the flesh of swine. So. I'm not saying that it's, a, that it's a bad thing to find scientific facts, it's very good. But we should not become people who rely on scientific facts for everything. What's the scientific fact behind the hijab? What's the scientific fact behind wiping over the feet? What's the scientific fact behind any of those things? Ali bin Abi Talib, oh, he makes such a beautiful analogy. He says, I want to prove to you that this religion is by Allah's decree that we don't do the deeds that we do because of other reasons. We only do it because Allah commanded us. What's the proof? Hey, hey, what's the proof? When you have socks, when you have shoes, we're at the park, right? Prophet Park, over there, uh, Caesar's Bay. It's time to pray. We make wudu. You know, hands, thing. We do all that, right? Then we get to the foot. What do you do with the foot? If you have your shoes on, your socks on, what do we do with the water? Wipe over it. And even Abi Talib, he said, why don't we wipe underneath it? Wouldn't it make sense to wipe underneath? That's where the dirt is. But this is not a religion that we need to rationalize everything. We wipe over the top because Allah said wipe over the top, period. 
That's the beauty about this religion. We don't need scientific facts to back us up. But if we find it, mashallah, alhamdulillah, now I know that I'm more anxious in the middle of the month. So, you know, my kids are going to tell them, 34 to 15, just stay away from me because <laughs> I'm anxious in those days. But we don't need to rely on them. We do the deeds that we do in this religion. Why? Because we believe in Allah in the last day. Not because of this scientific fact, not because this has been proven, not because of that. We do it because we believe in Allah and we believe that Allah, He has the authority to uh, dictate to us how we should live our lives and we should strive as best as we can for the you're on a three question minimum. So, no, continue, continue. Why do men have to wear towels when they go to Mecca? That's not, that has nothing to do with it. That has nothing to do with it. I know the reward for praying later in the night is more, gener more rewarding than praying it at any other time, but we're not gonna do it. I'm not saying not to do it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it, but I'm saying that there are some of us we cannot wake up even if our life depended on it. We cannot wake up. We need like 10 alarms. And so Abu Huraira, he was the same. So when we look at these companions, we should take into consideration and know that they were human beings like us as well. They did have very virtuous qualities about them, but they were also human. Abu Huraira, he would find difficulty in waking up in the middle of the night. And so he would the Prophet advised him, so that you don't lose the reward of praying at night, pray in the beginning of the night. Make the witr in the beginning of the night. What does that mean to pray in the beginning of the night? Right after the Isha. Right after the Isha. Because you cannot make Qiyam al layl you can't make the night prayer after Maghrib because you didn't pray the Isha yet. So literally, we just prayed the Isha just now. We just prayed the Isha. Then you're gonna make two rakah sunnah when you get home. All you have to do is just make another two rakah and then one witr and go to sleep. And you get written down that you have prayed in the night. I mean, that's so easy. No pressure. It's not about waking up at two, three in the morning. If you know you're not able to do that, you pray the Isha, you pray two rakah sunnah after that, you get home, you just make two rakah, one witr, done. You get reward of night prayer. Now, is your reward the same as the one who woke up at three in the morning? No. No way, can't be, cannot be. But you still get the reward for praying in the night. Any questions on that? Brother, what, does it have to be like Ramadan when we do the back? Like, no, Qunut in the witr is not an obligation, only for a need, only for a need. Any other question? Okay, and so we get to the point that we wanted to cover, Salat al-Duha. <clears throat> the Prophet advised him to make two raka of Salat al-Duha. And so we are still um, covering Duha. We don't know when Duha is, we still don't know can you make more than two raka? Can you make less than two raka? We don't know what's the virtue behind it, but there's two more hadith, we're gonna cover it. The second hadith is on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha. And she said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to perform four raka of salatul duha. Wa yazidu ma yasha. And he would increase to that whatever he wanted. He would increase that however he wanted. So right now we know that Salatul Duha, it could be two raka, it could be four raka. In other ahadith, it can be six raka, it can be eight raka, or it can be 12 raka. That is Salatul Duha. If you collect all of the hadith on Duha, you find that the Prophet, he prayed it just two raka. You find that he prayed it with four. You find that he prayed it with six. You find that he prayed it with eight. And you find that he prayed it with 12, not with 10. You cannot make 10 raka of duha because we don't have any narration that the Prophet he did that. 2, 4, 6, 8, 12 raka. And the last hadith is on the authority of Abu Dhar radiallahu an, in which he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and this is where we're going to get to the reward of praying this prayer. When you get up in the morning, Charity is due from every one of your joints. This is the Prophet, he's speaking. 
the one who doesn't speak from his desires, but what he's speaking is revelation. Allah is commanding him to tell us this, that every morning you wake up, charity is due from each and every one of your joints. What's a joint? Can you guys show me what a joint is? This, this is true. Just I'll the show <laughs> The hand is a joint. Okay, yeah, the wrist, you know, all the things that connects all the bones, right? This is a joint, this is a joint, our wrist is a joint, shoulder joint, knee joint, toes, all of that. Over 300 joints in the body. Over 300 joints in the body. The Prophet, he said that charity is due upon each and every joint when you wake up in the morning. It's due, meaning you have to pay it. Then the Prophet began to tell us of charity that we can do to pay on this. What can you do to pay on these 300 joints that we have in the body? The Prophet, he said, there is a charity in every tasbih. So when you say SubhanAllah, you get one charity. If you say SubhanAllah again, SubhanAllah, 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 three charities. There is charity in every takbir. Every time you say Allahu Akbar, you get one charity. There is charity in every tahmeed. Every time you say Alhamdulillah, you get one charity. And there is charity in every tahleel, in saying La ilaha illallah, you get one charity. And there is charity in enjoining good. Every time you enjoin good, that's a charity. Can you give me an example of enjoining good? Can you give me an example of enjoining good? Any enjoining good, when you tell people to do something good, you get a reward. Can you give me an example of that? Well, what could you tell somebody? Like a reminder. Like what? Pray. Pray. He just reminded, hey brothers, the prayer is about to come in. He get, boom, one charity, just for that reminder. And there is a charity for forbidding evil. Can you give us an example? Forbidding evil, Allah will give you one charity, one reward for that. Oh, if you're hanging out with your brother and he curses, they don't curse. Ah, if you're hanging out with a brother and he curses, you say he's telling him don't curse. Just by telling him, yo, yo, watch your language, slow down, pump the brakes, don't curse. Boom, 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 you get the reward for it. There is charity. Oh, and the Prophet said, and he ends with, and two rakah of salatul duha is equal to all of it. Meaning, I said there's over 300 joints in the body. Every day you have to pay a charity per joint. You can either say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allah, I can remind people with good, so you have to remind 300 times, somebody do this, do that, do this, do pick up the dirt, da, da, kiss your mother, da, da. you have to remind 300 people, don't do this, don't do that, that takes a lot. Or sit there, SubhanAllah, 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 every time you wake up, the Prophet Sallam said, if you just make two raka of salat al duha, you paid all the charity on your joints. Just two. Not four, six, eight, twelve. But the Prophet would pray duha. Two, four, six, eight, twelve. But the minimum that was required to pay on these joints is just two. Um, the Salat al duha is it before the Zahar? The Salat al duha we're going to get to the time. The Salat al duha we're going to get to the time. So, what is Salat al duha It is a Sunnah prayer. What does it consist of? Two rakah. Is it an obligation to pray Salat al-Duha? No, it is not an obligation. And as we mentioned earlier, the Salat al-Duha was not something that the Prophet did all of the time throughout his life. As a matter of fact, there were two companions who used to say that praying Salat al-Duha is a bid'ah, is an innovation. From among them, Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, would say, there's no such thing as Salat al-Duha. From among them, Abdullah ibn Abbas would say, there's no such thing as Salat al-Duha. But other companions would say, no, there is such a thing as Salat al-Duha. It is narrated that Abdullah ibn Abbas anhu, was telling his students, there's no such prayer as Salat al-Duha. I don't know what you're talking about. And his students said, come, let me take you to Umhani. Let me take you to Umhani radiallahu anha. And he took Ibn Abbas to Umhani, and Umhani said, when the Prophet ﷺ first came into Medina, he came into my house and my mat, and he made two rakah of Salat al-Duha. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, oh, okay, I accept, that's it. That's it. Remember, Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar, you may say, how could they say there's no Salat al-Duha? This shows first and foremost, there is no individual that possesses all of the knowledge. 
I'm sure there's a hadith in here that some of you know that I've never heard of in my life, and it's authentic. No one person possesses all of the knowledge. Two, the Prophet wasallam never used to establish it all the time. He would pray duha two, three months, and then like, don't pray duha at all. And then he would pray it again, maybe two years later, he'd pray, 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 as if he's almost going to pray for the whole year, and then don't pray. And we know when you read the seerah of the Prophet, there's battles going on, there's moving Medina, there's so many things going on that it is feasible that some companions just never saw him pray that prayer. And thirdly, Abdullah bin Umar and Abdullah bin Abbas, they were young, just like Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As. Four of the laws, all under the age of 17, when the Prophet sallallahu passed away. So all of these things that has happened, it was happening when they were 9 and 10. What are they going to really remember? 9 and 10 and 11 and 12. Abdullah bin Umar, Abdullah bin Abbas, Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As, and the fourth Abdullah. You guys got to do some research, find that out if you really want to know. Second, what is the reason? The second issue, we cover four issues to every prayer. What is the reason for praying Salat al-Duha? Why do we pray it? We covered why we pray it. Anyone want to tell us? Why pray Salat al-Duha? Why? To pay the charity you owe for your 300 joints. Pay the charity. School started back up, right? <laughs> Everybody's in there sleeping. <laughs> to pay the charity on your bones that's due every morning. That's why you pray Salat al-Duha. Three, the time for the prayer of Salat al-Duha. When do we pray this prayer? Do we pray it after Fajr, after Duhur, after Asr, after Maghrib, after Isha? Before Fajr? Or after? Before Fajr? Or after? Or after? Yeah. I'm guessing at any time you want. Any time you want? Before the Duhur Salah is the correct answer. The prayer should be offered before Dhuhr prayer. Sheikh Ibn uh, Uthaymeen, Rahimahullah, he defined it as being from a quarter of an hour after the sun has risen, meaning half an hour after sunrise. Not after Fajr Salah. Fajr Salah, we pray it, and then the sun doesn't rise for maybe another 45 minutes. So, what is the time to pray the Salat of Doha? Some of you have never prayed it in your life. Some of you want to pray tomorrow just to get that good charity, to start something good. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, the time for Salat of Doha is a half an hour after sunrise until 10 minutes before the Dhuhr. Can you say a quarter of an hour? Huh? You said a quarter of an hour. Quarter of an hour, half an hour. You're broke. Why don't you get too technical now? You read Allah, you read the Bikum al Yusra. I'm making the religion easy. Take it easy. Slow down. So, half an hour after Fajr, after sunrise, right? 15 minutes after sunrise, 15 minutes, we want to get technical. 15 minutes after sunrise until 10 minutes before the door. This is the time that you pray Salat al Doha. And how do you pray Salat al Doha? You go home and you tell your mom, oh wow, there was a speaker talking about Salat al Doha. It's so crazy. You know, it gives you the reward and this and that. And you know, and this is the time to pray it. And your mother, your auntie, your uncle, your brother, your sister says, how do you pray Salat al Doha? How do you pray? What do you tell them? Two raka. Two four six eight. Four raka. Six raka. Eight raka. Twelve raka. How do you pray? Do you pray twelve raka straight? Do you pray eight raka straight? Is it permissible to pray four raka straight? Can you do that? No, it's two by two. Because we have the hadith of the Prophet so that to lady one nahar, methna methna. That the day prayer and the night prayer, as it relates to nawafil, as it relates to extra prayer, it is done methna, methna, two by two, two by two. So even though we haven't covered it, most of you are familiar with the four raka that should be made before door. That is not prayed for one shot together, it's prayed two by two, two by two. So I'll read this last two sentences and then we're done for the night, unless there's some questions. The description of the prayer. The prayer consists of two raka. The minimum number that has been reported is two, and the maximum number that has been reported is twelve. 
Um, and the Prophet ﷺ, he prayed duha with four raka and with eight raka when he did the conquest of Mecca. When he came in and kicked in the door and took back Mecca, he made four raka of Salat al-Duha. And in another narration, he made eight raka of Salat al-Duha. Are there any questions relating to this sunnah prayer, Salat al-Duha? Any questions? So you pray either two, four, eight, or 12, is that what it is? Yeah, you pray either 2, 4, 6, 8, okay. or 12. You don't pray I know 10. it's not mandatory, but once you start, you have to keep on going, or it's just when you can? Um, no, you can just pray whenever you like. So if the Prophet didn't establish it, like he did it all the time, mm -hmm. then you should pray it however you like. You should pray it, you know, today, tomorrow. You can leave, off, leave it off on the okay. Wednesday, and then pick it back up again. It should be something that we do, but it should not be a prayer that is lost. Because it is authentic, and as we mentioned, there are other ways to pay the charity. You know, just saying SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Akbar. But we should establish this prayer because it's only two rakah. That's the title, it's only two rakah. Just knock it out and follow in the example of the Prophet. Um, um, why not ten? Because it's just two ten. Because the Prophet didn't do ten. But if you pray two, 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 two. You're gonna get the ten rakah. If you pray two, 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 you're gonna get to ten, but it would not be permissible for you to stop at ten. That wouldn't count as salat al duha. You say to yourself, "I'm gonna make ten rakah." First, that's innovation. This wouldn't be accepted at all anyway. So you have to pray two, 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 two. Then you get to ten, and then you gotta get to twelve if you really wanna be written down that you prayed the Doha and get the reward. So you're either going to go all the way to 12 or you're going to stop at 8. But if you stop at 10, I mean, good luck. I hope it, I hope that Allah accepts it. I don't know. Maybe minimum is 2. 2 minimum. That's what we're all aiming for, right? No one's going to. I don't know why everybody's fighting me on 10. No one's going to do it. Just 2. Just 2. The 2 raka tomorrow, 15 minutes after sunrise, up to 10 minutes before and Allah knows best. Any other questions before we let everybody go? Everybody's good?